Hello and welcome to the Trap Little Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Runcy. Today we have Ace Patterson back. We're going to be having a conversation about Rhythm and Flow, the Netflix show that came out last month. Well, it's funny because when I first hit you up about this, you seemed like you weren't that interested in the show for some reason. What was that all about? The 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 first episode and a half didn't really capture my attention, so I was kind of just like, ah, man, whatever, and just moved on. Uh, thought that Netflix was uh, targeting me and, and with all types of prejudice that just because I've watched Hip Hop Evolution that I would naturally like this show as well. And I was like, you're absolutely wrong. And just kind of went on about my business. But then a lot of people were just like, man, like, this is so good, so good. You got to get like past episode four and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, uh, no. <laughs> but then when you hit me up, then I was like, all right, all right, fine, y'all, fine. I'll sit down. I'll make the time uh, to watch it. Uh, thought maybe I'd multitask and do a bunch of other stuff. But uh, yeah, once I got to episode five, then I, I'm not going to lie. I was, I was pretty hooked to the very end, me and my wife. <laughs> yeah, same here. Me and my wife, we watched it. And I feel like that was the turning point. Because before, it seemed like things felt a bit standard. You weren't sure where it was going to go. But once we were able to get to the cream of the crop and the show, I think, did a good pace structuring each of the different things that happened towards the end of the series, too. I think we really got to see the talent itself. And I think the show itself got to shine as a Netflix product. Definitely. I have a few pros of what I liked about the show and a few things that I wasn't feeling as much. So like I was saying before, I thought the structure was great, especially towards the end. I felt that having the top cream of the crop do music videos, do features with other big artists, the samples, and then the final performance, I think that hit a pretty accurate gamut for what a artist today has to go through. So I think that was good. And it made me think often about which current superstars would do well in those format and who wouldn't. And we can talk a little bit more about that. No, I definitely agree. I feel like, um, you know, it definitely, it it was, it was kind of like a, uh, how to be a rapper, like training court, you know what I mean? Like a one-on-one starter kit, (laughs) like you need a video, you know, you need bars and you like capture the crowd and all these kind of things. And it, and it really like, you know, segmented these different pieces into episodes. And I thought that was really cool. Uh, even the, um, you know, especially when you get towards the end and they do the the features on an R&B track is like on the outset, you're kind of like, uh, like not every, not every rapper does a feature on an R&B song. But then when you really like sit back and think about it, you're like, yo, but you know, when you hear like fabulous, you know, feature or Jada Kiss, right? Like featuring on an R and B track, and you know, they're they're like hardcore like bar droppers, and yet they be on R. You're like, dang, yo, like you kind of do have a point. Like these are like like this is hip hop, you know what I mean? This is the culture, and and you know, in a way, even though they compartmentalize it in this fashion, if you even like if you just take the show aside, it's like, nah, these are all like these are all real. This is exactly like what you know rappers within the industry uh do or like should know how to do at the very least right and it's not that everyone necessarily needs to be a jack of all trades although it's great to at least have some expertise and skills in those areas so you can but even it made me think even the best of the best aren't amazing at all these things right like mm-hmm. one of the biggest knocks on kendrick for as great as people find kendrick is that he is not the guy that's going to bring the verse home if you have him on the guest verse. Like that's not necessarily the role that he's played in. So it'd be interesting to think like someone like Kendrick, who I know that D Smoke, who ended up winning this competition, got a lot of comparisons to. How would someone like that, as opposed to someone like Drake, the whole concept of the cosine and the guest verse was made for someone like him. So it's interesting to think about. Yeah. I, I I would also say too, just to uh, echo a bit of what you said. I feel like not everybody that law. I mean, so, some of the people that got cut should have got cut for real. Uh, and I think that was part of the reason why it was kind of hard to like just sit through. But then I understood, it. you know, it's kind of like American Idol at the beginning. Like, yeah, like there's some people that you just gotta like sit through that and ah, uh, and then they get cut and then you move forward and then you get to like you know what I mean <laughs> headphones off and really enjoy it. But um, you know, some of the folks that did get cut, I, like. 
you know, they right whether it's like, oh, you know, they're not really like a freestyler um, or, you know, a battle rapper or whatever. It's like not being a bad like Drake's not a battle rapper. Like, you know, back to back isn't what the culture would consider like battle rapping. That's a diss track. Right. But as far as like being a battle rapper, that's a completely different, you know, genre, skill, craft in itself. And so just because you are not able to do one of those things doesn't mean that you can't be, you know, equally big or, or self-sustainable within the music industry. Um, and so, yeah, to your point, like if everybody had kind of like a scorecard, <laughs> so to speak, right, is like the, the four finalists weren't like a 10 on every single thing, uh, but they definitely like in aggregate, like on average had the highest score in general. I'm glad you brought up the battle rap piece because I was thinking about it specifically in terms of how they eliminated folks because you had the fi- the final group that made it to quote unquote Hollywood was the group of 30. And then after that, it got cut down in half because of the the battle rap. And I know that you have to go through and have people go through each of these things. Like we're saying, there's a rubric or a checklist that people go through, but was battle rap strong enough to have that be what cuts out half of the people at that point? I thought that was an interesting decision. And I think especially now, even looking at the judges, like only one of those people that were the judges, maybe T.I. possibly had strong success doing battle rap before, but it's not necessarily something that's reflective of hip hop, like to your point with Drake. So I was interested from a sequencing perspective how I'm like, it could have been music videos or it could have been some other type of thing that is much more relevant to the average mainstream artist experience of what sets them apart as opposed to something that frankly is a defining factor of what we would see on like uh, 106 in parks freestyle friday 20 years ago yeah i mean i don't know like what folks were talking about right in the production room and they were like oh you know we want to do this that and the third um, and maybe season two will look different or maybe season two, they might double tap on battle rap. <laughs> but I will, I will say that uh, I loved back when I was like a little, little kid, loved 106 in Park, Freestyle Fridays, loved, um, you know, I'm one of those people that I like watching people, you know, use punchlines in like a sparring kind of way. And I do think culturally speaking, um, freestyle battles are a significant part of it. Um, And so it's kind of like a question of, is uh, rhythm and flow designed to preserve the culture or is it just stereotyping elements of the culture for the sake of consumption? And I would hope it's the farmer. Um, And maybe like in season two, there'll be more elements of like, this is what hip hop is and (laughs) you know what I mean? Um, but I, I do think that whether it's like the guests, the guests that they had on these shows, um, you know, the, 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 the guest voters like Jada and Snoop and things like that to, um, the different elements that they, they double tapped on. I think, you know, maybe, maybe it was just like, again, like I was saying earlier, like how to be a rapper, like what is hip hop starter kit 101, which for a lot of people like across the world, like it was dope. Right. Cause even thinking about just like who's the audience, I mean, it's not, it's not, <laughs> it's 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 not the old head necessarily in in New York. You know, it, it's supposed to be consumed across these different countries in the markets that Netflix is at. And so, what what do they know hip hop as? And honestly, especially to shout outs to the globalization pieces that you've been writing, I mean. I think outside of the U S there's more of an appreciation for the full hip hop culture than necessarily the U S. So if anything, you can argue that those battle rap portions went really well (laughs) abroad. Right. (laughs) Because it's like, yo, like this is the culture. Whereas like in the U S it's like, Oh man, we're off that. We're just about vibes and feeling, you know what I mean? It's interesting. And you, you brought up something earlier in that you were talking about the judges, both the guest judges, but also the three chance, the rapper Cardi B and T I. What were your takes on them as judges or as yeah oh yeah I thought I thought they were I um I mean it was kind of obvious that like you know Ti's there to like be stern and direct and Cardi's there for like 
you know, wild personality that she delivers. And Chance was kind of like the the happy medium, you know, it's kind of like the 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 three dope compadres. Um, but that aside, like personality aside, which is, you know, at the end of the day, that's what we want celebrities for, like their personalities. I thought their advice was pretty straightforward and, and solid. I thought that, um, you know, they were really dropping like knowledge, you know what I mean? For anyone that is considering, um, you know, how to market yourself as an artist, how to relate and connect to your fan base, how to um, deliver your brand in an authentic way through your lyrics um, you know, I feel like those were basically like the three big themes that you would continue to hear, um, throughout the feedback and the critique. Um, and, you know, s- small stuff around like the external qualities, you know, how you're dressed or this and that. I feel like those were just more so tapping into like for the artists, like, like, who are you? Right. And, and it really goes down to like, if, if this is who you say you are, then this is what you should be doing. Or this is how, this is how I'll be able to understand who you are based on, you know, these, these factors. But it was less about like, I I felt like a lot of the, minus like the beginning, again, like there was one feedback earlier on in the beginning where Snoop Dogg was like, man, you look like you smell good. And then like this person just went in and I was like, is that real feedback? (laughs) You know what I mean? I was like, what, what is that? Uh, That, that did not sit well with my soul. There were some bad guests. There's some bad. Yeah. I was like, come on, fam. Like, but then, then you hear the background and you hear that, like, you know, the show and the cast, like basically like pulled up on these guests, like 24 hours before it actually happened. I was like, yo, we need you to do that. And it was kind of like on the fly. Jada was saying in an interview, like he didn't really know what was going on, but he just showed up, you know what I mean? For the culture. So from that standpoint, it's like, I, I get it. You know, it is what it is. Right. Uh, but yeah, generally I thought the feedback was solid. Yeah. When I was watching it at first, I wasn't sure how the judges were going to play out, but after seeing it conclude, I think they did pick, the right three people. There could have been a few switches, but I think Chance was the one that impressed me the most. I think he stood out almost as the lead judge, if there is one, like if there was a quote unquote Simon Cowell equivalent in this. He's the one that kind of spoke that out to me because I think if we're looking at the three of them uniquely, he, you could tell this is someone that almost came up in a, not almost, but this is someone that came up in theater and drama and how he thinks about things from a technical, from a flow perspective, it's very on brand in a way. And you can see how he is that thoughtful with what he's done and everything he's done to date so far. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah. And I think that Cardi's presence as well spoke to who she is too. Like she knows that, okay, it's great to have the music that is, thoughtful and the music that may be conscious or what you're saying, but am I going to remember you? Or is this going to be um, insightful? And that's pretty much how she's balanced her career. I think that they were good. And what it made me think about is the fact that this show, unlike let's say American Idol, didn't have any type of audience or public participation. I think what drove American Idol in those days was fans were calling mm. in. Like I literally remember getting into it back in the day and like texting mm-hmm. who I wanted to win American Idol like a fanboy. Like nah. that was me. Young Dan <laughs> wanted Ruben to go to the top. No, but like legit, that was me. I was there. But then obviously that was removed yeah. from this situation. So it's like, okay, now you have judges making the decisions, right? And I was literally thinking about this the whole time. Would this have looked different if the public could vote for who they wanted to? Like if we looked at the finalists, let's look at the top six or seven of them, who would have came out on top? Mm. And I think in a contest like this, of course, D Smoke is very talented. Yes. Yeah. But if you think about the lens I was giving it in a judge evaluated competition that is evaluated by someone like chance the rapper who is as you know artsy and technical as he is of course the guy that you know speaks multiple languages and can play the piano and you know comes across you know much more like mature and experienced than probably most of the other people there it's kind of targeted for him almost in like a critical darling aspect but if this was left to like the popular vote how different does this look and which artist would end up winning this competition yeah that's interesting my my wife thought uh that d smoke was gonna win so she was actually rather happy with her predicament (laughs) um 
But yeah, I, I do think, I mean, honestly, so of course, Netflix model is like the binge model. And um, it's interesting that they chose to do like a semi binge where it was like, it wasn't one episode at a time. It was three episodes at a time. It was like, we don't, we don't want to do the Hulu, but we don't want to like do the old fashioned Netflix way. So we're just going to like piecemeal it. Um, but I do. Why is like this awkward in between? Yeah, it's really awkward in between, but I obviously didn't feel it and neither did you. Cause we didn't <laughs> watch it till the very end anyway. Uh, like YouTube already told me who was going to win before Netflix did, unfortunately, which is just like, dang man, like Netflix or sorry, like, the world can wait, you know what I mean? Like you see it all in the, the headlines, like D smoke tells why Netflix and Flair is like, all right, man, like, <laughs> I guess I'm going to watch <laughs> episode four and, and, and see what's up. But, um, I will say that to your point, um, I think that was one of the cool aspects of American Idol. And even when I was talking to, uh, to a few people about, you know, the first couple episodes, they were reminding me, Like, you know, back in American Idol, like there used to be like weeks where it was just like the people that they cut, you know, and maybe it wasn't, maybe it was days, I don't know, whatever. But like, there was a significant period of time where it was just like, the people were like, if we had memes, then like, they would just be memes for like two months straight. And then you got into like the actual casting. And so, um, you know, I, I do think that there is a space if Netflix chose to even try that route. Um, and especially if they want to vie for attention, um, and, you know, fight cable companies, but then also do it at a national or sorry, global level is, uh, yeah. Have like a live component, have like a, you know, this is happening right now and we need people to vote. But I think that, you know, it's very obvious that rhythm and flow, the way that it was packaged, it was, it, it was, it's like, semi live you know like there were live aspects of it but it was obviously like produced it was like we're all gonna meet here and even you know there were some areas where it's like okay we're gonna go up to ebro in the morning and we have all these people and we're trying to decide who's going to be and there was like two people in the room you know like there was obviously some like pre-vetting before these folks even got into the room and i think that you can't in order to ensure that you're gonna have the type of show that you want of course you want to like do extra to produce it. But then if you kind of want that real authentic reality aspect of the show, then, you know, you would, you would make it more live. Uh, That also being said, everybody and their grandmother is a rapper. And so maybe that's why it wasn't live. (laughs) Maybe it was just like, this would be a really long show. (laughs) If like everyone came out, it was like, I'm trying to be on season. Yeah. What I think this opens the door up for though, is that that clearly is another model that they could have went with. And it probably could have been successful in a different type of way if it's done well. Because I think that Rhythm and Flow follows this competition format that has done well on Netflix. Like it's almost, in some ways, it's almost more similar to like that great British Bake Off show than it honestly is American Idol. Even though the subject matter is the same, just like how things are being evaluated and stuff like that. With that said, I think there is a room for the type of show you're talking about and whether that is another thing that Netflix has under its belt, whether it's Hulu or Disney Plus or whoever else wants to start a streaming service now comes up with the concept. I I think there's a lot there and I think there's opportunity to grow on this. Yeah, I mean, like at the end of the day, hip hop is the culture. Um, It's been that way for quite some time. Uh, It was according to... I guess Nielsen or whoever did the report, it like became pop culture <laughs> or like, you know, the popular mainstream genre to listen to like a couple of years ago. And so, I mean, there's just, and then, and there's just so many more documentaries and series and hip hop inspired, like Netflix did that beats uh, movie with Anthony Anderson uh, and like, you know, based in Chicago. And it was like a different angle to talk about Chirac like through the form of hip hop music. And it's just like, like put hip hop in it and people are going to flock to it. And so, yeah, whether it's Netflix or a different competitor, I mean, I've, I love the Wu-Tang show on who, I mean, (laughs) I I don't know if that's supposed to be a guilty pleasure or not, but I really liked it. You know what I mean? On, on Hulu. And so, 
It's interesting to think about this show as well in the landscape of music today, because with American Idol, they position themselves in a very powerful gatekeeper role. People just couldn't go on SoundCloud and build their own career from scratch in 2002. They had the power of, yes, you win this contest, we will sign you to a major record label deal. This will be a multi-album contract, so on and so forth. That was something that was promised with it. In this, it's different because obviously it's not geared towards a record label deal. It's a non-committal $250,000. It made me think about the role of this show because obviously Idol was so powerful because the landscape was positioned towards the record labels and the gatekeepers. But now, yes, Rhythm and Flow gives you a ton of exposure, but you really don't need a show like that to make it in hip hop the way that American Idol truly was a or make or break point for so many people. That's true. That being said, shout outs to the folks that made this this Rhythm and Flow show because it is just another avenue, right? Like it, it is a, um, it's just another way uh, to do something, but it's specifically for hip hop. I was just thinking as you were talking, like American Idol, like because it was for mainstream America and the and the genre at the time that like hip hop wasn't like it just recently started to be considered a genre kind of thing. It was like basically like country and R and B is gonna be like the, the, the finalists. Right. And so to have a show that's specifically for hip hop and you go in there and, uh, the, you know, everyone Nipsey hustle has that line where it's like, I came from nothing. And so did every other rapper, you know what I mean? And so it's like all the, all the stories, like we all have stories. And so I'm not gonna like talk about anyone's story, but it's just like the fact that folks can come from wherever they came from and then just have this moment where, you know, even if they, even if they made it to like, whatever the, the, the top 16 or, or whatever, like you've, you, you have eyes on you and there's going to be people um, to the point about uh, your wife saying, if it was up to the popular vote, London B would have won. I'm sure there's people saying that about like, um, I'm trying to think of an, like beans, you know what I mean? Like, oh, if beans didn't do the freestyle, like she could have, right, like gotten the, gotten the goal. And so it's like, you're gonna, just by nature of being a part of this ecosystem, like you now have people that are, you know, going to want to follow you regardless of whether you won or not. And I was watching that Sway uh, interview with the four of them. And Troy man was saying like, you know, my Instagram following before the show was 3000. And in the past 48 hours, since the last episode of the show, it grew up to 100,000. 80 to 100,000. So it's like, it's like that right there to your point, you know, tremendous exposure, uh, especially being, you know, one of the finalists, you didn't even win. Um, sure, like it, it, artists shouldn't be like, oh, okay, so the only way that I'm going to make it is to be on this show. They, they absolutely shouldn't think like that because it's 2019 and the way to make it is literally like just to record on your laptop and throw it on SoundCloud. But um, you know, just to know that there's another avenue and this was created just out of like, out of a concept. Like it, it sounds like these are real people, <laughs> you know, it, they, like these aren't actors. These are like real people that were already doing music before the show even came out. And so if you are already an artist that's on your grind, doing your craft, like Troy was saying, like he, he already had been performing, you know, opening up for Bone Thugs and whatever. So he's been on his grind. And so for folks that are already within that mindset, then it's like, I, right, you know, like, here's another thing that I could potentially put in the strategy, just like how people, you know, apply to uh, be on the South by Southwest uh, uh, stage to perform. You know what I mean? It's funny as we've been talking about this, neither one of us has mentioned the hip hop competition show that did exist, which is making the band. <laughs> Go get me some cheesecake that, yeah, that's, that's a relic, man. Dang. Is that is is, is uh, the number three? Is season three really coming out for real? I would be surprised to see it come out. I know there was the media, pu- the social media push that Diddy did a couple months ago, but I, I doubt it's going to come. Because if I remember making the band right, they had well, they had a few different seasons. The first season was the band, 
And that was with Dylon. That was with Sarah. Oh. And th- those are the, all those epic things, right? That was absurd. And that group didn't do anything. And then the second one, <laughs> I believe, was Don't David be so King. rude. <laughs> Oh, what, me being rude yeah. about what, the band? Yeah, the band, the band man. Do anything. Babs, man. Name Come one DeBand on, song. Uh, Name one DeBand song. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. Bro, now like, yeah, the best rapper but, of all time, top five. <laughs> That's all I know. But but the second group was Danity Kane, and Danity Kane actually did have songs on the radio. Dang, Danity right? Kane. Wait, what about yeah. Day 26? Which one was that? They were after. Okay. Yeah, they, they were they, they were there, though. But yeah, they were after. Got you. So, but yeah, so it's interesting because I do feel like that show was more a reality show. That was like, how do we take this real world successful concept and base it around music and the the ridiculousness of diddy as opposed to something like this yeah we need with this being we need the old diddy man it it can't be the new diddy with this new making the band he has to he has to go back to his ridiculous ways (laughs) no it would be funny to see so the other question we had that we're thinking through is if you were the person i won so if you're d smoke and you got two hundred and fifty thousand dollars what would you do with that money? Buy a bunch of rims, donate them. Uh, $250,000, you said? Yeah. That was the prize, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, shoot, man. I Like, what would I do? Uh, I would probably just use it, the majority of it, for, for marketing and promotion, to be honest. Um. If 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 I'm in the position that they're in, and it's a matter of where do I go next, um, I would just invest it in the business, um, and just leverage where I'm at right now to, you know, what I mean, like uh, link up with a a videographer, assuming that I don't really have one. Link up with you know, basically put the team together and then. Yeah, just just push, 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 push. <laughs> but you, you know what I mean. Like you already have the luxury too of um, like having people's attention, and so just ensuring that like the quality of what you're putting in front of people, the creative assets are on point, um, and ensuring that you are getting it heard by the people that you want to hear it. That's really. <laughs> that would really matter. Yeah, because I, I think there's nuance to this in that it isn't 250 starting completely from scratch. This is 250 and you already have the exposure of this show. Like D Smoke has um, over a million Instagram followers now. And I know you mentioned Troy Man and most of the other finalists are in the hundreds of thousands now. So you have the awareness and you have that. But the thing is, I think the biggest shifts is they were probably doing everything purely DIY themselves, how do you still keep the strategy that you take, but relieve some of the pressure off yourself so that you can focus on more things? So it's like, how can you extend yourself? Can you take that 250? And who knows, like, do all those people have set managers? If they do, if they don't, is this time to either have a set manager or you find someone to level up and help with that? Is there someone else that can help you with additional things? Like, I think it's, yeah, it's budgeting the marketing and budget, budgeting the promotion, but also leveraging that to like, okay, what either what tools can I leverage or what people can I leverage to just expend more of my time to do what I need to do? And I mean, the money's probably going to go away pretty quickly depending quickly. on how aggressively it's used. Yeah. But I think now the opportunities just expand so much more and it's... um. And it's going to be interesting to see not just where D Smoke, but literally where everyone else does too. Because even on that last episode, London on the track already had London B hooked up with the deal and so on. Like Troy Man already had things in line. So everyone is going to have opportunities like no different than you know, Jennifer Hudson didn't win American Idol, but she still came out good, right? It's that same type of mentality. Yeah, no, 100%. I mean, like basically you need to get a recording studio that you own if you don't already have one get a dedicated content designer um video graphics etc uh get your publicist because clearly 
there's a lot to discuss. Um, you would start putting out content um, from a video perspective, song perspective, if you haven't um, already have like some quality stuff out there, or even just put out a new one and, and just push that so that way people can hear it. Um, but then start paying attention to all the data that you have around people that are now listening to your music and the domino effect of you uh, winning and having these 250K and just be like, yo, I'm about to just hit these markets and do some shows and um, put out feelers, get a get a booking agent who you wouldn't have to um, pay for out of pocket because they're going to get a percent of whatever you're able to get. Um and you know that that's assuming that you don't have enough time to do it yourself, but really it's just reaching out to these venues and being like, yo, this is me. This is what I can do. Uh, trying to perform here at these dates, set up a little run and um, yeah, make some merchandise too. And if you're not a creative person that can think of merchandising, then get somebody to develop the merchandising for you. Um, but yeah, outside of just like the actual process of, of, getting the music out and getting yourself in front of the fans. Like you just need to, you just need to be on and be present. Right. I think a lot of that varies based on the artist too. Like, I think there's specific lanes that D smoke can go into and push a bit more. I remember the first time that he went up there and TI was already like, I hear you speak Spanish. That's already making me think of additional revenue streams. Like, you know, it sounds a bit hokey, but that's how the industry thinks about these things. And I think it played to his, advantage being able to shift and do it in a way that wasn't corny like it it was actually it was it was authentic and real when i'm thinking about hip-hop now and i think about okay what are the artists that blow up i think i was a little surprised that there wasn't someone that rose high in the finals that was a singer slash rapper because that's pretty much the Drake formula that so many other people have copied, whether it's Future and others. Like, I think they tried to make Flawless Real Talk seem like that in a way, maybe just because he was light skinned and just because he kind of had a little bit of that like subtle, you know, arrogance, but cool confidence, if you will. I'm, I was surprised that we didn't see that archetype come through in the show because I was like, that would have been the quote unquote crowd pleaser that in many ways reflects this past decade of hip hop. Yeah. 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 I mean, like you had your, you had like that guy that um, got cut kind of early, but sounded a lot more like what the current scene sounds like. Actually, there were a lot of people that sound like what the current scene sounded like that didn't make it. And so um, I don't know if that's a reflection on who is judging. Right. Exactly. um, Or if like that's, what just the true standard you know what i mean because some folks will argue too like the folks that are oh you know whatever this isn't real or you know the, especially the ones that are like oh you know you don't need to be a battle rapper in order to be like a rapper da, 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 are are less about like the culture and more about like yo let's just let's just do whatever we want make this sound make this paper you know what i mean and there's a there's an obvious lane for that um, Cardi B herself said that she doesn't really care about the culture. She's just in it for the money. And so, which is why a lot of her feedback was really around like, Hey man, like, am I going to be able to make money off of you at the end of the day? Um, so I don't know. It, you're, you're right. Like the, as far as like the archetypes didn't really have kind of like a, this is the 2019 archetype. Um, and they try to force it a little bit. Um, but I think it is cool that the four artists that were the finalists were able to, like, you could see them do kind of like, they were versatile enough that they could do like the, this is the super poppy thing. And like, this is the, the super hard bars thing and then everything in between. Yeah, I agree. Cause at that point to even make it to the final four, you had to demonstrate a decent level of excellence on several of the things. And I think that's one thing the judges were good at. Let's say you didn't come through on a particular thing by the time you got to the finals. It wasn't like, okay, like D Smoke, this wasn't your best, so we're going to knock you now. It was like, okay, you've kind of proved yourself up to this point. I think London B had a similar thing where there were points where she may have messed up, but like there was enough proving at that point where they could look at things holistically. And I think that actually helped folks a lot more because in a competition where folks would 
vote every week, every week becomes this head to head matchup where it's like, what have you done for me lately? The audience, people may have their stands, but they forget real quick or they'll forget real quick what happened last week and you'll get penalized for what may have happened this week. So I do think that the judge has helped regulate a lot of that. Last question before we head out, which contestant do you think is most likely to be the most successful? And the answer may be D smoke and that's cool, but it's a different question because D smoke a hundred percent. I, nah, I mean, I've weighed my pros and cons. Yeah. Uh, evaluated i think everyone has a shot for sure so it wasn't as easy as i enunciated it 10 seconds ago but yeah i would put my my bet on d spoke i'd say i'd say uh they're all dope um but yeah i think he he i mean he's already he already won an ask cap award for songwriter of the year like I, i feel like he's well positioned to do what he needs to do whether in front of the scenes or behind the scenes to be honest, it'd be the same. It, it, it has to be him. I was trying to think, okay, can I get interesting and pick something a non, and, and pick <laughs> a different answer? But no, I, I wasn't even going to do that because that would just be inauthentic and lame. So mm. no, I, he even from the initial episode, it really felt like this was a seasoned veteran almost going in and playing with people that weren't necessarily on the same level yeah. and not so much with the other finalists. Cause I think they were talented as well, but it just felt like he was a level above uh, almost every single week with everything. And it was, it was pretty early on to see that he was the one that was going to rise on top. And that's not something I don't feel like I've necessarily noticed if I'm thinking back to watching whether it was an American Idol or any of those other type of competition shows, where it's like you can kind of see the front runner early on. It's like you're watching basketball. And yeah, you know, there were those seasons where the Golden State Warriors were the best team. And you're like, okay, by Christmas, you know who's going to win the NBA Finals. It was that feeling. Uh, any closing thoughts on rhythm and flow? I'm really curious to see because there's there's been avid talks about a season two, I'm really curious to see how they switch it up. Uh, whether, you know, the way that they produce it, if it's going to be live or the same format, the same semi live binge kind of thing, or, you know, even the, the structure of the different, you know, loops and exercises that the artists have to do in order to get to the top. Um, and if they're going to keep the judges the same, if, it's going to be Chance or Cardi or Ti. That's kind of like the the remain like the the consistent through line of judging. Um, or if they're going to do something completely different. Just yeah, excited to see it evolve and how it becomes even more a part of the culture. So I know people hit you up and asked you, okay, if you were just starting off right now because you have your rap career, and I know a number of people were like, oh hey, you should do this, you should or like, do you think that if you were just starting out, this is something you would have considered? uh not me not me or i like consider like considered it i would have like considered the conversation but i think um i would have wanted to see what like now that i see what it is i was like oh okay maybe i'll consider it but i think at the onset um i don't know because what i was afraid of especially in the first few seasons is like is this just going to be like a gimmicky thing um, for people that like, you know, just not want to make fun of hip hop, but you know what I mean? Just use hip hop as a trope for just like content consumption, but to see, to see the finalists for, and to see like their realness and, and the reality of what they're able to, or like just their mindset of like the whole process and, um, you know, like hearing London talk about working with Tiana and things like that. It's like, oh, like this is a real, this is a real experience. And they were real artists before then. Da, 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 da. Um, so yeah, now I think after watching the whole thing, it's different than the the beginning when I was like, what is this show? So we sold you on this one. We'll see if there's another piece of content that comes out there. I'll see if we, if you, if you need selling for that one. <laughs> word, word, tag me, tag me. 
If you enjoyed this podcast, please go tell at least one friend about this podcast. Word of mouth is still the best way to grow. If you use Apple Podcasts, please go rate and review. That helps continue to boost Trapital Podcast in the rankings. And also, please go to the Trapital.co website. That's T-R-A-P-I-T-A-L dot C-O. There is a ton of great content there. So please check out the articles, sign up for the newsletter, and I'll see you all next time.